Church. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Excellent. My name is Eric Dixon. I'm here uh, serving this morning and helping out the worship team and, and uh, thankful to be here. You'll probably see some of uh, my crew coming in and we, we come with the circus. So as we gather this morning, uh, let's start with the uh, reading out of um, Psalm 136. And I'm going to read the first line and then as I read it, if you would like to respond, we can all respond together for his steadfast love endures forever. So let's try it together. One, two, three. For his steadfast love endures forever. So I'll begin in verse one. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. I invite you to stand with me. If you hadn't seen a theme in that psalm, uh, God's faithfulness, God's love endures forever. So let's stand and respond to God's word together and sing. Should I fear? For I know that you are with 
Cause all my life you have been faithful Cause all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Establishing your kingdom among us. I pray as we continue to lift our voices, to sing as one, to profess and confess who you are and what you're doing in our lives as individuals, our lives within the church. And we pray that you'd make us one, as you are one. Help us to be grateful for the things in our life that we see for the things that remain unseen more 
then I can't say we'll see. Yeah, your love is real. It comforts and it heals. Even when I don't feel you're here, you are here. Jesus begins his preaching ministry in the gospel according to Matthew. He says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now that word repent comes from the Greek word metanoia, which literally means change the way you think because the kingdom of heaven is near. It changes everything. There's no location there's no group of people that get to experience the love of God more than the other. There is no place that we could go. No depth that we could go to. No height that we could attain. Change the way you think in every circumstance. To recognize how much God loves you and how much He's called us all to extend that same love to one another and the world around us. Let's sing together, you are here in the waiting. You are here, here in the waiting, in the pain, you're not forsaken. All your promises are new in every way. You are here at the dawn of new hope that's ever longing to know your love at work in everything. Oh God, you are more than I can see. You're more than I can say or sing. And your love is real. It comforts and it heals. Even when I don't feel you're here, you are here. God, thank you for making our path straight, for calling us into faith and a life of faithfulness that you lead and demonstrate in Jesus Christ. God, make our path straight as we trust you. Holy Spirit, God, help us to bear the fruits of your presence. Help us to know how close you are even when we don't experience it. Know it, understand it. For you're faithful to do what we cannot, always. Always calling us back to the truth that we are loved by you. God, I pray that the most true thing about us would be evident in the world around us. That they are loved by you. And that as we worship in spirit and truth, God, help us to know there's no place that we could go that you're not already doing work. That you're not already establishing your goodness. And that you're calling us to those places to participate with you in divine collaboration. God, be glorified in us, your body. As your church gathers throughout the world, make us one. In Christ. God, I pray for those who are sick. I pray that you bring healing to their bodies. I pray for those who are in prison, that they would know that they're not alone even now. For those in mourning, God, that your peace would bring them comfort. For those in the hour of death, God, that they then know that life is sustained only in you and that there's nothing that could separate us from your love. God, thank you for everything around us. Thank you. Be glorified in us. We ask and pray these things through your Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus and all the church said. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward so that we might present to the Lord his tithes in our offerings. Amen. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give. Lord, we have just spent just thinking about who you are, the goodness of God,
that this is your world, that you are here amongst us, Lord. And Father, as an aspect of just this, uh, of the worship we've already entered into, we continue by giving to you a portion of what you've so richly given to us. Lord, we pray this as we always pray. Pray for the giver and the gift. And Lord, may it all be done with a cheerful heart and an expectation of what you're going to do for your kingdom with it. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank Eric for leading us in worship. For those of you who might not know who Eric is, uh, he has a history in this church. He grew up, he and his brother, grew up in this church. And uh, how many of you remember Eric, Eric when he was just a, a toddler? Okay, I see those hands waving. Uh, first time I met Eric was at a, the GA in uh, Blowing Rock, North Carolina. And uh, I was the speaker for the camp and Eric was the worship leader. And at the time, he wasn't even married. And now he's married with four kids. So time has changed, right? Yeah, we can clap for that. So again, Eric, thank you so much for uh, leading us in worship. And uh, we just appreciate your ministry so much. Um, I also want to point your attention to the flowers here. Uh, in case you were not aware, um, there was a funeral this week for a woman that we dearly loved. Her ministry, her heart. And that was Darlene Barnard, uh, Angie Jones's mom. And uh, we said goodbye to her, uh, earthly goodbyes to her on Friday. And it was a wonderful service, just a wonderful tribute. But that right there represents uh, her and especially her gifts of playing piano that she played for f over 40 years in this church. And what a ministry. And we just praise God for her life and her ministry. And uh, we will see her again in the kingdom. Praise God for that. So, if you would, would you turn with me? Our scripture text is taken from John chapter 4, a very familiar story for, for all of us. Um, and we're going to be uh, reading about the woman at the well, John chapter 4. And I'm going to start by verse 1 and go to, I think, yeah, verse 20, 26. I'm going to give you a moment to get there. John 4, verses 1 through 26. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to, in a, to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would not have asked him. You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. So the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. 
Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, in the spirit, and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word this morning. Let me ask you, what's your, what's your first thoughts, sir, about people who seek significant relationships by placing personal ads, whether online dating sites or back in the day newspaper? Uh, I think people still do that in a newspaper. I mean, what's your, what's your first thoughts about that? And you might say, well, you know, it's, it's a dangerous practice because especially today, you don't know who you're connecting with, they're total strangers, you know nothing about them. But you also might say, I feel sorry for people who have to resort to advertising to secure a relationship. And in saying that, I hope none of you met here online. I'll feel really guilty about what I just said. But anyway, have you ever read, regardless of how you feel about dating ads, I must confess that they can be really entertaining. Have you ever read any of them? Have you ever spent any time? I did a Google search this week and discovered some fascinating ads. Just wanted to share a few with you, see if you, see if you uh, feel like I do towards some of them. Uh, like this bizarre ad, wanted somebody to go back in time with me. This is not a joke. You'll get paid after we get back. Must bring your own weapons, safety not guaranteed. I have only, I've done this once before. Okay. How about this clueless ad? Single white male, old, fat, balding, many disgusting habits, seek single white female with money, send pictures of your house, car, RV, and then this tagline, this could be your lucky day. Isn't that awesome? And here's one that no man could resist. I hate men, at least most men. I'm looking for a man who can change my opinion. Sure, she got a lot of responses to that. And then there's this honest ad. I appreciate the authenticity. When I was 30, my dates had to be young, slim, tall, and handsome, rich, and intelligent. Now that I'm 64, they only have to know how to read and use the phone. <laughs> but not to be outdone is my personal favorite, and it reads, single black female seeks male companionship, ethnicity, unimportant, for a very good-looking girl who loves to play. I love long walks in the woods, riding in your pickup truck, hunting, camping, and fishing trips, cozy winter nights, lying by the fire, candlelight dinners will have me eating out of your hand. I'll be at your front door when you get home from work. Call this number and ask for Daisy. The ad turned out to be an adoption offer for a black Labrador retriever, and it received 15,000 responses from men across the country, and that's a true story. <laughs> now, would you be surprised if I told you that God, who we, we know is the architect of all relationships, has placed a personal ad? He's searching for a people with a particular heart. And I just read about it, if you caught it. It's a heart of worship. And God's personal ad is found in the John 4 passage that we just read together. And it's found amidst the, uh, what I believe to be for myself personally, it's the most captivating conversation that we have recorded in the Bible. I just love this conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well. And she is, and by the way, she's, I, I can't wait to meet her in heaven because she's all, we don't have her name. She's just anonymous. She's just the woman at the well. But it's a very intriguing conversation. And the reason being is that we know that Jesus broke all kinds of relational and cultural boundaries just by speaking with her. A, she was a woman. Now, one ancient quote tells you all you need to know about the religious hierarchy's feelings towards women. A rabbi, Eliezer, I quote his words. He says, the words of the Torah should be burned rather than entrusted to a woman. Any self-respecting rabbi would not even walk down the same side of the street with a woman, much less engage her in conversation. So we start there. Now move on to the fact that she was also a Samaritan. 
And I think most of us who know any kind of Bible history know that the, the, um, the full-blooded Jews had a huge problem with their mixed-race brethren. In fact, the hatred was so deep that they prayed, listen to this, they prayed that Samaritans wouldn't be raised from the dead at the resurrection of the dead. That is cold. And C, she was also a woman of questionable morals, of loose morals. And we know Jesus shared her relationship baggage by saying, you've had five husbands and the man you live with now isn't your husband. Now this is the person that Jesus initiated a conversation with and it all started with the generic topic of water until Jesus laid out her relational history and I, I love her response. I love her response. It's so clearly she says, sir, I can see you're a prophet. And at that point, after Jesus reveals her relationship history, she does what we might do when someone strikes a nerve too close to home. It's called changing the subject. And here's what she asks. She asks, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship while we Samaritans claim it here in Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worship? She wants to know What's the deal with worship? But Jesus is perfectly okay with going down this rabbit hole. Look at verses 21 and 22. I believe we, we have them up here. And it goes like this. Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter where you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship while we Jews know all about him, for his salvation comes from the Jews. In other words, ma'am, your question about where to worship will soon be irrelevant. Because the Messiah is coming, and he will usher in a totally new mode of worship. And then Jesus laid out God's personal ad for what he desires in his worshipers. And it's found in verses 23 through 24. But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. That's, there we go. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth, God's personal ad sounds like this. God seeks true worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. Now, what does that really mean? The reason I ask that is because Christians, most Christians might struggle to answer that question. They'd say something like, well, worship, what is worship? Well, worship is like, you know, you're worshiping in, in spirit and truth. So to borrow a phrase from the question from the woman at the well, what's the deal about worship? And let me start here. Have you ever wondered why God insists on worship? Why is it so important that we gather every week to do what we're doing now? You know, sometimes I will say to Kim, I say, I'll say to her, do you realize, Kim, how lucky you are that you're married to the hunkiest, smartest, funniest man on earth. I'll say that to her. And you know what? She, that's usually the response I get from her too. She just laughs. And why does she laugh? Because she realizes she doesn't need to feed my narcissistic ego by telling me how great I am. She doesn't need to do that. So why does God insist on worship? Why does he need us? Why does he need me to tell him how great he is? God already knows it. If worship is not about filling God's unmet ego needs, God doesn't need us to help him develop a healthy self-esteem. Can we agree to that? So why do we worship God? We worship God, yes, because the Bible commands it, but not because he needs it, but because we do it. I need to worship because without it, I can forget I have a big God and subsequently I will live in fear. I need to worship because my natural tendency is towards self-reliance and stubborn independence. 
I need to worship because I can forget God's blessings and promises and walk around with a gratitude deficit. Why is God holding out on me? And if we're to understand worship, we first need to understand why we worship. And then Jesus said this, that true worshipers will worship God the Father. Now this is important because we tend to uh, have the tendency to approach God like consumers. And as long as I've been in the church, I've heard people talk, they've used this phrase, that, that when they talk about worship, they'll often talk about getting something out of it. I, uh, you know, that service is okay, but I didn't get anything out of it. And people can tend to sit back, arms folded, and think, go ahead, wow me. Grab my attention, pique my interest. Worship can be like watching a movie and then critiquing it afterwards, you know, giving it a certain score. I like this, I didn't like that. I think of the Israelites standing before God at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, verse 18, and we read these, these verses. Mount Sinai was covered in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. Now amidst that setting, can you imagine the Israelites muttering to each other, all this fire, smoke, lightning, is too distracting. I like quiet, dignified worship. I don't like Moses' worship leading. I prefer Aaron. I hate the tambourine songs we're doing. I really don't like them. And if God doesn't get off this mountain by 12 o'clock, I won't be a happy camper. <laughs> Instead, what we read is what? Everyone trembled. They were overwhelmed with awe and fear. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you that not a soul was thinking, I hope I get something out of this. They worship God. There wasn't a shred of doubt of who their focus of their worship was. There's a true story of a six-year-old boy named Michael who for his birthday wanted a party at a local Chuck E. Cheese restaurant in Boca Raton, Florida. Have any of you ever had the privilege of, a, of being at a Chuck E. Cheese restaurant? There's been a few of you. I hear the groans already. Um, it's, it, if you have never been, it's a children's focused restaurant and entertainment center. And the, the hero or the theme of is Chucky himself, who's a giant mouse, okay? So his parents invited all of Michael's friends and family to the home of Chucky, the giant mouse. And, and when the party was finished, all the adults and the children were herded up into three vans. That is everyone except Michael. And around closing time, Michael was found wandering around the restaurant alone. And so the restaurant called the police, and the police came, they did a little detective work, and it was discovered that Michael's mom and grandma both assumed that he was with the other. Michael par Michael's party proves that it's entirely possible to have a joyful celebration and forget the guests of honor. Can this happen in our worship? I mean, can we be so preoccupied with wanting the music we like and having the sanctuary at the right temperature and and making sure no announcements are forgotten or that our service doesn't go over time or keeping the money talk to a minimum and watching to see if people are gonna welcome us. We can be so preoccupied with our celebration that we forget the guest of honor is God. And some of us may need to do some repenting because we've made worship about ourselves rather than God. And I understand how easy that, that, that can happen. So according to God's personal ad, he's looking for true worshipers who focus their worship upon God, the Father. And secondly, they worship in spirit and truth. Back to verse 23, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. Now, what was the time that Jesus was referring to? Jesus was talking about a divine timetable. In his very near future, Jesus was to be crucified on a cross, and at the exact moment of his death, a very significant event would take place in the temple. 
The Jerusalem temple contained a sacred room called the Holy of Holies, which housed the Ark of the Covenant. And the Holy of Holies was known as God's dwelling place, which could only be accessed once a year by the high priest. And the Holy of Holies was separated from the rest of the temple by a very large curtain, which symbolized the veil which separates God and man. And when Jesus died, the moment Jesus died, the curtain covering the Holy of Holies was literally torn from top to bottom by God. And what was the spiritual significance of this event? Well, in Hebrews 10, 19, we read this. We can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain and the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. Through Jesus' sacrifice, the veil has been lifted, enabling us personal access, personal connection with God the Father. Praise God, right? But what does this have to do with worship? Everything. The whole landscape of worship has changed. Worship is no longer dependent upon external things like gold inlaid temples and, and fancy garb priests and elaborate sacrifices and off-limits off limits rooms like the Holy of Holies. Through Jesus, we have personal access to the living presence of God within us in the form of the Holy Spirit, which means what? That the location of worship has changed. She asked about that, the woman at the well. Our true worship center is found here in our hearts. And that's great news. Because God has taken worship out of the box. Our worship isn't confined to a sanctuary once a week. And I think most of you realize that. You can worship at your desk at work. You might even be able to worship driving on 40. Or that might be a little bit of a challenge. Walking the treadmill at Planet Fitness, singing in the shower, make a joyful noise, right? However, there's one critical qualifier that Jesus talks about. He said our worship must be done in spirit and truth. Now, what does this mean based upon the fact that worship happens internally? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 15, 8 through 9, he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. In other words, Jesus says, look, your worship is unacceptable for two reasons. It lacks spirit and it lacks truth. The first problem is that your hearts aren't engaged. It's just empty. This is just empty, lifeless routine for you. And secondly, you're not focused upon God's truth. You're all about man-made teaching, man-made ideas. And to me, what Jesus is saying is that true worship engages both our hearts and our minds, our emotions and our thoughts. You can't separate one from the other. They, they must be in tandem. I remember once taking my son to a worship service of 20,000 people. It was the church of the Chicago Blackhawks. NHL hockey team. And let me explain what that worship was like. First of all, there was a very sacrificial offering we gave till it hurt. $180 for the tickets, $18 to park, $550 for a slice of pizza, $550 for a Coke. And this was probably 15 years ago. Secondly, we ate our pizza a few rows from Bobby Hall and Stan Makita and it, I, they might not mean much to you people but they're legendary Hall of Fame hockey players and people approach these two men with with awe and reverence they're, they would take pictures selfies with them people were handing Stan Makita and Bobby Hall their children so that they could get a picture holding their kids and then we all stood for the national anthem and I tell you what, I've never heard singing like that in church. It was just really passionate. 
And when the Blackhawks scored, and they did a lot of scoring in that game we went to, everyone sprang to their feet, high-fiving total strangers. I've never seen a high-five in worship. <laughs> the emotion and passion was contagious, and I have to confess, I wondered why is it that we in the church seldom worship with our hearts fully engaged like that? We worship the creator of the universe, the Messiah who lives and walks with us. That sure beats Bobby Hall and Stan Makita. We give in advance to God's kingdom, which is a whole lot more exciting than paying for parking and a slice of pizza. And when we started to sing in unison, we, we stood as one, we stand in one in Christ. Doesn't that supersede our country's national anthem? And when we celebrate a kingdom goal, shouldn't we be just as passionate? Someone comes to faith in Christ, transformation in Christ, being healed. You should be excited about those things. Now, I know this is uh, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but shouldn't our heart-engaging, truth-seeking worship rival the worship of a sporting event? However, let me be honest with you, though, there was still a missing component at that hockey game, which disqualified it as true worship, and that was there was a lack of truth. There wasn't any focus upon the truth of God as revealed in his word. Who is God? What has he done? What has he promised to do? There wasn't any deep thinking about God. A lot of noise and passion, but no truth. You see, sometimes church worship can resemble a sporting event. Lots of excitement and passion, providing it this emotional rush of adrenaline. And, and that rush is so important because if we don't feel anything, there isn't any authenticity to it, right? Isn't that old song lyrics true? If it, it can't be wrong if it feels so right? Let me use a deep theological term here. That's garbage. If you come to church just to feel good, if you're disappointed when you leave because you didn't feel anything, you're basing your worship on your glands, on your emotions, and worship is much bigger than our glands. Amen? Amen. Your deepest worship experience might be a truth that God embed, embeds in your mind as you leave this place of worship, and all week long, you just savor it and mull it over in your mind. John Piper is a pastor I highly respect. Um, I think he's retired now. And here's what he said. He said, truth without emotion produces dead orthodoxy in a church full of artificial admirers. And emotion without truth produces empty frenzy and cultivates shallow people who refuse the discipline of rigorous thought. But true worship comes from people who are deeply emotional and who love deep and sound doctrine. Strong affections for God, rooted in truth, are the bone and marrow of biblical worship. Spirit, truth, heart, mind, emotion, thought, bone, marrow, in tandem. So I close, I close with this. There was, was a husband who wrote, or a pastor who was also a husband who wrote early in our marriage, I gave my wife a terrific anniversary gift. I gave her a rain gauge. At least, I thought it was a great gift. Susan, after all, is a farmer's daughter and keeps close watch on the weather. I envisioned her delight and nostalgia while tracking our backyard precipitation. I congratulated myself on my creativity. Guess what? Susan was not impressed. A rain gauge for our anniversary. The rain gauge is now a family joke and a classic example of a gift enjoyed by the giver but not the receiver. One word you hear a lot these days is authentic, as in we seek authentic worship. Usually this means we're trying to create an experience that helps worshipers feel something. Nothing wrong with that. But if our focus is only on our experience, we may be giving God a rain gauge. Are we offering in worship a gift we enjoy and figuring God will like it? A real gift, real worship, means knowing what's important to the receiver. And what's important to God, as we've heard today, is a heart of worship. 
Not because God needs it for his sustain, because we do. He wants to be worshipped in spirit and truth. Let's pray before Eric comes and closes us in song. Father, I confess, Lord, I've been a part of thousands of worship services ever since I've been a child. And Lord, they can run together. And Lord, there's, there's, been, there's been some, Lord, that I know that I've fallen asleep. There's been others, Lord, that I wept half the way through. And Lord, all of us have had the experience of of, a myriad of of, of worship experiences. But Lord, that's not what's important. What's important is if we we capture the spirit of worship. And Lord, it's not just about coming on Sunday. That's just an aspect of it. Lord, it's it's about, Lord, seeking you in spirit and truth, heart and emotion. And Lord, I pray for our worship. Lord, this is just the first week. I know next week I'm going to continue to talk about worship and how we we can rekindle a spirit of worship in our hearts. And I pray that for everyone here. Lord, may you rekindle that in us because Lord, we know that worship is such a huge piece of our walk with you and our ability to be transformed into the image of Christ because Lord, Jesus was a worshiper. Lord, we pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Oh, my life, I've been carried by grace. Don't ask me how, cause I can't explain. It's nothing short of a miracle I'm here. I've got some blessings that I do. But that's how you learn It's nothing short of a miracle I'm here I think it over and it doesn't add I know it comes from above I've got miracles on miracles
receive the blessing however you'd like to receive it. You can close your eyes, you can raise your right hand, you can hold out your arms, whatever, however you want to receive the, this blessing. Receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His presence and go before you and give you peace. Go forth to love and serve the Lord in all that you do. Amen.